from day one, I'm like, I'm kind of the anti-bike shop, bike shop, but it's actually like the anti-cycling store. I just need to like reach people with bikes in their garage, normal families. Say I had my phone on my handlebars and I just kept hitting refresh on the numbers. I'm like, guys, this is working. Really, I mean, it changed my life. In this podcast, we talk with Andy the Bike Farmer on YouTube on how he's making a bike shop in rural Wisconsin work by catering to non-cyclists. We also talk about why he started a YouTube channel and how it's changed his life. Without going into my whole history or whatever, but I took a long break from the bike world from the early 2000s to the mid, you know, around 2014 or something like that. And when I came back to the bike shop and started working on bikes again, I was like, whoa, like so much had changed in that 10 years. And I was like, how is this even a thing that's sustainable? And it got worse from there, you know, in the last eight to 10 years. What, what were some, what were the, the big changes that you noticed? I think at the time, like 11 speed was just coming out, like Shimano 11 speed, which works great. Um, but the 10 speed stuff didn't work great, especially the road 10 speed. And so just with like the cable running, the cable routings coming out of the levers, you know, the two different ways, and you know, there was all these workarounds and this and that. And like, if you go dive into like Tiagra from that time, there's two different kinds of Tiagra and like the compatibility, mm -hmm. like, I was like, what do you mean mountain bikes aren't compatible with road bikes? <laughs> you know, like what is going on? Why would they do that? You know, it didn't make any sense at all to me walking back into it. Um, disc brakes. Um, I was like, holy crap. Like, tune-ups used to be easy and now like you've got these rotors that like to bend and if they're just off by a little bit you get ting 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 and that's not acceptable to the customer and you know i could spend 20 minutes trying to true a rotor and i don't know i mean i'm a somewhat decent bike mechanic i think you know and i'm like why do they make it so hard and then i'm like <laughs> why are these disc brakes on these bikes i'm like regular people aren't going to want to deal with this garbage and then tubeless you know it's like it's so messy what do you the people really need that and i'm like i understand with goat heads and that kind of thing you know it was just all of that so i was watching one of your uh videos and you'd mentioned a little bit about how you started the bike shop or what was kind of your what drove the ethos of the shop you asked a friend for some business advice and they told you you know look at what's wrong with the industry and and try to come up with a solution what was the solution that what was the problem that you identified and how have you shaped your, your bike shop to address that problem? I'd really realized that like, I'm really good at tuning up bikes and I love bikes and I should probably try to figure out how to make this work in my life. Um, I was kind of hanging around with some entrepreneurial circles and a friend of mine was kind of embedded in that world in Madison. And he's the one that said, you know, start looking for the problems. Don't just think about how to start a traditional something or another. And so, that's when I was like, you know, the problem is, is schlepping bikes to the shop for service and, and coming back. So I came up with this brilliant idea of a mobile bike shop, which turns out has been a thing for quite some time. I just never heard of it somehow. Um, and so and I came up with the idea of like a, a sprinter van and then a website where people can make appointments. They go tune up bikes. And so I started the bike mobile. That was what kicked it off and then after my first season in the bike mobile which went very well i mean madison really latched on to the idea which was great um i live in this little town outside of madison about a half hour um 10 miles south of trek and um i always said there's no way i could make a living with a bike shop in lake mills but the old gibbs bike shop property in lake mills came on the market my ex-wife sent me a text it was like august or something september she's like you know, this is available. You want to go look at it. So, and she's a realtor. And so we did. And so I decided to move in there upstairs and reopen Gibbs bike shop. And that's when uh, it just coincided that another big shop in Madison had closed down like a year or two earlier, but they were finally getting around to clearing out all their fixtures and tools and equipos. And so I was able to pick up all of the stuff for a little bike shop for super cheap, like crazy cheap. Um, and that's the guy that told me, you know, hey, if I have any advice, you know, so you don't get upside down like he did. Um, he's like, ignore all of the industry trends, just do whatever works in your tiny market, in your ecosystem, like do what's right for you for your bike shop, you know, keep it independent, 
and right-sized is what he was saying. If you guys like this video, please consider joining us on Patreon. You'll get behind the scenes weekly video updates, as well as discounts to some of our favorite brands. Or if that's too much commitment, hit the super thanks below the video. This channel is unsponsored by the bike industry. We're not getting paid monthly, yearly by any bike brands, and we're directly supported by viewers or listeners just like yourself. Let's get back to the podcast. What kind of bikes or what kind of people do you service? From day one, I'm like, I'm kind of the anti bike shop, bike shop, but it's actually like the anti cycling store bike shop. And it's because it's a really small town. It's all very, you know, working class for lack of better, you know, terminology. Um, people don't have a lot of money to spend on bikes. Um, they're not cyclists, but we have a wonderful bike path. The trek is 10 miles away. So like we do have like bike cycling in our culture sort of, but they want like $400 bikes max. <laughs> which mm -hmm, you can't right. do with new bikes. And so I do a lot of used bikes, um, right away, um, giant. I mean, at the time, the timing was good and I was able to open a giant account, an account with giant, which I don't think I could do today, but, um, they were really excited to have a, a dealer that close to track and, um, you know, tap into kind of this local family bikes kind of market. And so they've been really cool with me, um, just buying the basics, bread and butter bikes. And that's what I do. And then tune-ups, like, right. frankly, I don't know a better way to make money than tuning up bicycles. Yeah. I just, I love doing tune-ups. So I sell tune-ups and used bikes and then entry level kind of, um, you know, giant hybrids. And it sounds like, you know, a, a big segment of uh, potential customers of the bike industry seems to have historically ignored or, you know, doesn't promote very well. Right. So, um, I like to say practical bikes for practical people. That's, that was like the original idea with, I mean, like my bumper stickers, I think I still have two left, you know, say that on them for Gibbs bike shop. Um, and yeah, it just seems like cycling culture and the industry, especially with the whole Lance thing and Trek really just abandon all the regular people. Like, I think there's a ton of potential there. Um, it's still going to be a little more than people want to pay, but I think there are, there's a way to make it big and normal and just have decent bikes. I think the giant Cypress, um, I sell a ton of them. Um, before that it was the Sedona I thought was the best, but the new Cypresses are just amazing. They're super comfortable. They're basic one by, you know, with one by drivetrains, that's a big part of it. You know, one right. eight or nine speed shifter. Um, I don't think they need disc brakes, but they all come with disc brakes now. Um, but really simple machines. And that's what people buy. I sell more of those than anything else. I mean, is it profitable to serve that market? It seems like less sexy than, than what like traditional bike shops focus on, but is it like sustainable business? I, for me, it has been, um, now it's just me. I had one employee working for me for the first five or six years. He was very young. I was very lucky to have him. He's the best. He's a true unicorn, but you know, when he turned 23, he's like, Oh, maybe there's more to life than this. <laughs> and so he's spreading his wings, which I'm happy for him, but man, it sucks for me. So now it's just me. Like I do everything myself. And if I could hire someone, I would, um, but it's really hard to talk a bike mechanic into living in Lake Mills, you know, a half hour from anything. And, um, it's a seasonal business for me, but if you keep it small and keep it simple, just like the old days where there's just like, the old man downtown at the bike shop, like that's how old man Gibb did it from 1933 to 1990. And so I picked up in 2017 and I'm trying to do it and it's working. Um, mm -hmm. but it's because I'm selling to the market that exists. I'm not trying to convince people that they need something that they don't. I think that's why it's working. What was your experience through, through COVID at the shop? Man, it was awesome. <laughs> It was, oh man, it was a dream come true. Um, I was curbside before it was cool with the, with the bike mobile. So, um, I basically, and I, I actually, as I was waiting for this to start this morning, I was texting a customer, like, um, you don't have to be home. I just need access to the bikes. You know, like it was perfect. I could just roll up. People would have their bikes out. I'd fix them. I'd put them back, send them an invoice. Um, and so I was doing. I had Alec running the shop here and we sold out of bikes just like everybody else. And um, I was able to get a bunch more, but I had constant access to used bikes and Alec had turned into a really good mechanic. So he was able to flip those for me pretty quick. So we always had used bikes, which is, 
happen. So I was poised there. Um, I ran out of the bread and butter bikes, but I was able to get some, you know, like KHS and some other brands to kind of fill in towards the end of the season. Um, but yeah, I was really busy doing eight bikes a day in the bike mobile and he was tuning up three or four a day in Gibbs and we were selling two or three bikes a day. It was crazy. Now I do like, maybe if I'm lucky, I'm selling one bike a day out of the bike shop and, um, you know, maybe three or four in the van, you know, it's pretty normal. How have you had to adapt the business uh, post post boom? You know, a big part of it for me is like, well, with post boom, it was just trying to get parts and stuff back in stock, just like everybody, you know, just be ready for whatever came through the door. Um, I really had to, I, I was right sizing in 2022, you know, I don't know why it took Trek two more years to figure it out. But, um, and then as I was right sizing, like that was part of Alec leaving was, it's like, oh, it just got boring all of a sudden because <laughs> it was so much fun for those two years. Uh, it was just exciting and very, a lot of action. And so it's just like, well, don't you remember 2018 when we were first starting and it was pretty slow? Like that's where we're at, you know, like mm -hmm. let's just yeah. chill out and let's have some fun and, you know, go for burger rides after work kind of thing. Um, but so that's what I've been doing. Um, and then without Alec, it's been more like I'll do two or three days in the van and then two or three days in the bike shop. So really reduced hours, simplify appointment only with the bike shop. Um, it's a small enough town. Everybody kind of knows me. I just put my number on the door. They text me, you know, or they'll leave bikes and I'll just grab them later in the day. That kind of thing. Did you, did you find like many people coming, you know, getting bikes for the first time during COVID and have they stuck around riding a bike? I mean, yes. Uh, a lot of people were getting bikes for the first time, which is actually again, right? I mean, most of them, I, I get a lot of customers where they're like, I haven't been on a bike in 20 years. Like that, I mean, it's a lot of, half of my customers are like that, but it's always been that way. So when the customers doubled or tripled, it was just twice as many people making that decision or coming to that realization that, man, you know, bikes are awesome and we shouldn't have them in our normal lives and that sort of thing. Um, now, as far as sticking around, um, I was never under the impression that these, that, you know, if it's half of my customers, I would say maybe 10% of them, it's going to get, it's going to stick and they're actually going to like biking and they're actually going to go use the trails. You know what I mean? I never, I don't know. I mean, it sounds dumb, but I just don't care how it's used. It, it sounds capitalistic or whatever that all I care about is the sale, but I really don't care what you do with the bike afterwards. I just love that decision that people make. Like they're like, okay, bikes are fun. I'm going to get one um, and I want to help get it right. I want to give them the best opportunity to enjoy that ride. I tell people that all the time. I'm like, you can save a hundred bucks here or you can save 200 bucks here, but you're not going to enjoy it. And we want you to enjoy it, you know, and I don't care about retaining customers. I know I should, but that's not what it's about for me. I just, I just like other people getting excited about bikes. So it sounds like you, like most of the people that you cater to wouldn't fall under the, like the cycling enthusiasts market like how do you communicate with them differently um than you see like the industry talking to cycling enthusiasts i believe i have a unique perspective on all of it because really truly i started as a mechanic i got into cycling i suppose um because i got into bikes i got into the machines i, I find them really easy to work on everything was is accessible and right in front of you and when i was 13 the local bike shop let me hang around and learn and um, play with bikes. And I hardly even rode them. Like I had one, but I, you know, we went mountain biking a couple times and a couple family rides around the lake sort of stuff, but I'm, I was never a cyclist. Right. But I understand the machines. Um, so I talk about the whole thing from that perspective, just naturally, like that's just my cycling worldview. Right. Like um, I don't look at it as a cyclist. Now, in recent years, I've become a cyclist. I got into randoneering. I do, you know, a lot of touring, that kind of stuff. Um, I, I like to just, you know, hop on a bike and go for a ride just to clear, you know, my brain kind of thing. Um, so I do understand the importance of a bike fitting well. I do understand gearing now. I understand comfort. Um, I understand why yeah, I got to have 
you know, 10 bikes hanging on hooks in order to get it right. Cause you never know what mood you're going to be in. Right. Like I understand all that, but I also understand that most people aren't that, you know? Um, and so I can add advice as a cyclist, but, um, most of the time I'm just trying to get people on the right bike for, you know, the best, um, best possible scenario for them with a bike. Right. So I just try to keep it really simple too, um, as much as I can. Do you see many, um, people, uh, transform into, to cyclists over time? Like what, what percentage, what percentage of your customer base? Two. <laughs> Two? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I avoid cyclists. <laughs> That's the other thing. It's like, it's so funny. And, and that comes from the van, right? So early on with the van, I didn't know what I was getting into with the bike mobile. And so I started going to charity rides and events, showing up at bike trails, um, networking with cyclists, and then they'd have their friends and I'd show up and they would have this, you know, two year old Trek Madone with all these fancy parts and like, you know, upgrades. Don't even get me started on that word. Um, and then, you know, I have the bike mobile come and, you know, their stuff would be stretched out. And I'm like, well, okay, I have, you know, some, you know, entry level 11 speed parts, you know, replacement parts. And they'd be like, oh, but is it Altegra? <laughs> and is it 32 tooth? And they would need, you know, and, um, and I was like, oh, enthusiasts have enthusiast needs and I have to meet mm -hmm. them and you can't do it in the van. And um, especially like ge geographically, I, I can't afford to bring bikes back to the shop, wait for parts, deliver them. You know, it's just, so expensive and cumbersome. Um, and so that's when I was like, whoa, scale it back. I'm like, I just need to like reach people with bikes in their garage, normal families, um, you know, all of the new subdivisions, like on the vinyl village, you know, where it's just these new subdivisions with people and they all have four or five bikes hanging in their garage. That's the sweet spot with what I do. Cause they, they've been hanging there for five or 10 years unused. I can pull them down and, um, you know, clean, lube, adjust and get their whole fleet, as I say better than new. I think a lot of times bikes are way better after that first or second tune up. And, um, and it's super easy for me to do. It's a win-win for everyone. So I discovered you and, and therefore your shop via YouTube. Like what was the impetus of, of, uh, of starting a YouTube channel? <laughs> Bob Ross. I mean, it's, it's that simple. It's the joy of painting. So I had discovered the joy of painting on YouTube. And I was like, Oh my God, it's every episode. And the first few that I watched, I'm like, Oh, this is mesmerizing. And then I started falling asleep. Right. So I don't know. When's the last time you watched an episode of the joy of painting? Uh, when I was a kid. <laughs> okay. So you're a painter. So you'll probably understand this, you know, intuitively, but he always starts with the sky and then water down below. I mean, almost every painting has sky above, water below. And that's, you know, far away and then foreground, right? And then he builds the painting out that way. And it's the same every single episode, but the, the image, the picture, as he calls them, is totally different every single time. It could be a seascape. It could be a mountain scene. It could be a wood scene. Eventually, it clicked in my brain. I'm like, I could do this with bike tune-ups, right? My bike tune-ups are the same way. I take the wheels off. Um, you know, I, I clean the frame, I lube all the cables, I lube the brake pivots, do the wheels quick, put them back on, set the bike up, final touches, and it's done. It's the same thing over and over again. So I started thinking about, oh, I could have a TV show. And then I was like, oh, but I could maybe do it on YouTube. Well, then I got into watching guitar luthiers on YouTube. I don't know. The <laughs> algorithm just started putting these guitar, cause I, um, I don't know if you can see, yeah, this guitar here. So I was watching this um, luthier, found this old guitar. I was watching this guy, Jerry Rosa, Rosa Stringworks, religiously. Like I just went through his whole back catalog. I was watching these hour long videos where he's setting up guitars. Then I bought this one and it had a broken bridge. And this is a Gibson Dove and it's got a very fancy ornate bridge. And he had a video, I think it was even two parts on how to rebuild a bridge. So I bought this guitar cheap. And then I reached out to him and was like, hey, I'm passing through your area on my way down to Austin to go ride a 300 K. Can I drop it off on Thursday, pick it up on Monday? And, um, 
he said, sure. So I met the guy and it's like, oh, you know, meeting a YouTuber for the first time kind of thing, you know? <laughs> and uh, it's like, oh my God, I'm talking to Russ. And uh, so, but I met Jerry and I started talking to him about his YouTube channel and he'd been doing it for five years or something like that and had some success. And then I asked him how much money he was making. He told me his best month and then his current month. And I was like, wow, that's like a nice supplemental income. And he had his, somebody doing editing his videos, which is like, oh man, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> and um, and then I, I asked him, I'm like, well, I, I fix bikes just like you do guitars. Is this something I should start? And he's like, you should absolutely start a YouTube channel. And I talked to him about Bob Ross. And, um, and so it's those two guys that, you know, combined is those are my bike fixing videos. Like that's really who I try to emulate right away. I started a channel and did a couple of my early videos, you know, it's like, they're awful, but you know, you gotta, you gotta start somewhere. And, um, I found a friend to help me with some editing through last season. And I, I watched the video, um, Ali Abdal, um, you know, he's out there selling all kinds of like how to win at YouTube stuff now. But something he said really resonated with me. And he's like, for, if you do two videos a week for two years, your life will change. And I'm like, I think I can do that. And so I've got a soft commitment that I've kept up with to do that since last March or April, this time last year. Um, and yeah, I finally got to the monetization point. And then the whole time I'm like, as soon as I'm monetized, I'm going to make the why are bike mechanics such assholes video. I'm like, I just knew it was a good idea. And I mean, that, the one, that video. one popped off. <laughs> oh my God. I mean, it was crazy. So that was, it was just so fun. It was fun making it. And then I released it and I had to get it out. Like, I don't know. I think I released it on a Friday night because, um, all last year I was stuck in the shop every Saturday. So I did no randoneering, but um, the local randoneering club, Driftless Randoneers here in Wisconsin, they did a late season um, two day. It was a 125K the first day, 150K the second day. So really bite size randoneering rides to get the Roulette award. Um, but it was late in the season. So I'd signed up for that. So I dropped the video that the night before and then the whole time riding bikes all day. I had my phone on my handlebars and I just kept hitting refresh on the numbers. I'm like, guys, this is working, you know? And it was so much fun. And I was like trying to figure out how much money I was going to make and all this stuff. But really, I mean, yeah. it changed my life. That video absolutely without a doubt changed my life. So, uh, so how fun. did, um, I mean, I feel like the, the title is really spicy, but your, your arguments and it was very like even keeled and, and reasoned. Uh, and it's like, how, what was the, what were the comments like from that video? The comments are, I mean, the comments section is really almost my favorite part about the whole thing, <laughs> because I've always had this thing, right. Where with Google reviews, where I'm like, if I ever get a bad Google review, it's probably somebody that's somewhat unhinged because it's clear that I'm going to make a mistake eventually. Right. And if they give me a one star review, it's just because like. I don't know. I mean, I can be a little bit edgy and like there are people in this world that do not like me, but I'm like, you know, so I'm like, I just want to get that bad review just so I can lay into them. You know, I'm just going to lean into it. And so the comment section for me is just like a gold mine. Like I'll wake up in the morning. If I'm a little grumpy, I just go to the comments and just start firing back at people. Like, you know, it's so much fun. Um, so I got a little bit of that, but overwhelmingly positive and supportive and like, oh my God, this is the voice we've all been waiting for. Like that kind of stuff. And I'm like, what? You know, like, you know, I didn't think it was that or at all. You know, I was just like, this is one guy's opinion and it's either going to work or it's not. But um, yeah. I, I kind of in that video and some others afterwards, it's like, I am saying the things that a lot of people are thinking that they're, they're not saying. Um, right. So, you know, I'm just going to roll with it. But a lot of people like to take offense too. <laughs> yeah the comment like i i have i have a very i don't know like i have some video ideas i know would probably do well but part of me is like do i want to deal with like the comment section after that video so <laughs> uh, well um i mean you're a very nice person you know you're a nice guy you've got a wonderful demeanor um wonderful you know i mean all of that you're just a good guy so it's not like your character to, i mean you're pushing back and you know party pace and um, the supple life and you're pushing back against the racing 
crowd and the unracer, you know, we're in the same zone, right? But yeah. um, you do it with far less cynicism than I do. <laughs> you know, so I say keep it up because you, you've got a you got a great thing going too. Um, like I don't know what was the the video you dropped yesterday. Um, the three reasons not to ride like a racer and right. you know you even in the beginning you're like like don't get me wrong if you're a racer that's perfectly fine too i'm not telling anybody how to ride the bikes you know that kind of right i would probably skip that part yeah <laughs> i feel like, like that's for, for me that's been kind of the worst part of doing youtube for so long is like i, I already know what the comments are and like i'm pre anticipate i'm pre pre-debating them in in the script and i've lost a little bit of that just like just go for it so yeah. for, for me, that's why it's re refreshing to watch your videos. I was like, oh, he's, he's not yet jaded. <laughs> yeah. It's I'm plenty jaded. Don't. Yeah. I mean, I definitely am plenty jaded. Um, the thing is, is like, I'm not, I don't feel like I need to make friends with everybody that watches my channel. I don't, I don't, you know, it's like, if you're going to come at me in the comments, you know, it's like, you're inviting me to, you know, whatever, like you've already bailed on me. What do I care? You know, um, and so, um, but some of it's been really helpful, especially on the on the mechanic side of things. Because, like I said, like I was really, you know, I really cut my teeth in the late '90s to the mid 2000s in the bike world, and that was reconditioning used bikes, right? And so much had changed from like 2005 to 2015 um, when I kind of got back into it. And so that 10 year period with all that development, I don't understand. Like I still struggle to bleed brakes. I've never taken apart a fork, a suspension fork. Um, you know, there's some basic stuff that I'm just not good at. I just don't have the experience. I avoid it because I'm afraid of it, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. So, and it shows up in my videos. That's one thing is I'm kind of warts and all. Um, and I learned that from Jerry, like he's a master craftsman, master woodworker, instrument builder. And like, he struggles on some of the most Base. I'm like, I could do that, but he like just struggles through it and he takes us along for the ride and just shows like, you know, we're all human. We're not perfect. You know, um, there's a lot of the other bike channels out there. It's like, you know, um, really just perfect everything. And it's like, no, 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 that's not how it is. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I appreciate, you know, when when things aren't super polished, like there's this phrase, uh, internet ugly. You know, yeah. where there is like a sense of authenticity, you know, it's not, you know, produced television. And I think there's a little bit more of a, a demand for it just because everything else on online and social media is so polished. So when when someone presents, you know, this is who I am, you know, I'm not perfect, then, you know, it's it's endearing, charming, uh, just feels more relatable. Yeah, absolutely. And um, that's what I'm going for. And I'm learning in the comments that that's what it's true. That's what people appreciate. That's what people like. That's why people are cutting the cable and just watching YouTube instead of regular TV. So you did, like you, you've uh, been at this, you've been at this a while, right? Like, I mean, how, how old is your channel? Uh, technically we started in 2009 when we, when we first toured, but I didn't take it seriously until we moved from Portland to Missoula. So that, that would have been 2017. Okay. Um, and I kind of, you know, I tried to get work doing freelance production and it just wasn't happening. So I had to go all in on YouTube, uh, while Laura had like a stable salary. So yeah. but I put out about 1300 videos at this point. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> like for me, it's like a lot of trial and error. You know, I don't have very many, many videos that, that go viral. Um, I just don't have that personality type. Like I, I want to like, I look at my stuff as like ed ed edutainment. You know, I yeah. want to be somewhat interesting, but I also want, you know, someone to walk away with like a little piece of knowledge, uh, with each, with each video. Um, yeah, yeah totally. So. Yeah. Um, so that it's interesting. So I have a few different types of videos. I do, I do the scripted ones, like the bike chop asshole videos. Um, and like, I mean, that's me and it's pretty authentic and I like that style of humor, you know, the kind of the roast humor and the edginess. Um, but a lot of times when I release those videos, it feels achy, you know what I mean? Like I'm being mean and I don't like how that feels, but I know it'll sell. Right. And that feels cheap and it feels sellouty. Um, yeah. but then again, it's providing me the opportunity to, 
do what I really want to do. And that's the bike videos, the bike fixing videos. And, um, you know, trying to help people realize that, you know, with a little bit of practice and the right tools, they could be flipping bikes too. And yeah. it's, for me, it's all about the bikes and like rescuing these products for whatever reason. I don't know why I love bikes so much. I don't know why I love 30 year old Trek hybrids so much, you know, but I <laughs> yeah. do. And I think, I think they're amazing machines and they're so durable and they're so practical. And so, you know, there's some hope out there that it'll get sticky and other people will either mm -hmm. make it a, a good hobby or even like when they're having an existential professional crisis, like I was, or it sounds like you were, you know, they're like, okay, I'm going to, I've got enough to pay the bills. I'm going to go all in and see if I can make this work. Like I really like solopreneurship and, you know, I mean, that's bike farming is, yeah. you know, the whole thing is like, let's just make it work somehow. I do that with actual physical bikes moving in and out of my life. I process a lot of bikes. I cultivate the the fields of bikes. Um, and you're doing it, I think, with your videos. You have different types of videos and you know, a constant and you have different revenue streams coming from other place. You know, you're you're um, definitely more content oriented, I think. Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. No, yeah, that's yeah. I, I make nothing <laughs> that I can uh -huh. hold in my hand, you know, which is like such a weird, it's a weird thing. <laughs> yeah, right. Which is nice because you can keep it small and move to Spain and still, you know, keep it. Yeah, income they, coming. yeah the, the, the overhead expense is very, very low. Well, let's talk about, um, you had a video recently that I thought was kind of interesting uh, and it was around the, the leaked uh, Trek memo about it, uh, you know, them having to right size and you gave like a really brief history of Trek, which I feel like in some ways kind of mirrors, um, you know, like the North, the, the story of the North American bike industry where it was yeah. very maybe practical at first. And then they got seduced by racing and haven't gone back to practicality since. <laughs> and that's exactly what that video was about. So thank you for acknowledging that. Cause I've been reading a lot of comments and it seems like people are like, aren't all the bike brands like this, not just Trek. And I'm like, Ugh. you know, it's like I pick on Trek because they're in my backyard. It's, you know, and I try to make it obvious in that video that it's like, you know, this isn't about dogging that brand or John Burke or whatever. Like if we all just put ourselves in their shoes, it probably would have gone the same way with for us, you know, like maybe our decisions would have been a little different, but you know, I mean, people said, you know, good luck on your, island of self-righteousness or whatever and it's like hey i've got my opinions that's all they are i'm not on some island of self like i was serious in the end of that video where it's like if anybody wants to sit down for pancakes and coffee in waterloo <laughs> let's do that let's talk it through because i want to understand yeah. this better so i don't claim that i'm an expert but trek was founded in 1977 and so was andy q so um it's been part of my life and the mothership has been looming over me since day one. Um, you know, my first bikes were treks. Everybody in town calls them trek bikes and it's a special thing. And, um, I mentioned it in that video, like a lot of my customers are like, I'm not a big biker and I don't need a fancy trek bike or anything like that. Right. <laughs> so, um, I'm not sure. I think that the trek origin story where really what they wanted to do was provide enthusiast quality bikes that could be bought by recreational cyclists right mm -hmm. so not regular people with bikes but not anything fancy right um that's what it was founded on because if you wanted a really high performing bike you'd have to buy from a european brand and it was super expensive and hard to get in the 70s mm -hmm. um so they started doing that so did specialized and giant i think was shortly behind them um you know it was like other people were doing it too. Um, but it really, in my opinion, it wasn't until the hybrids came along in, I guess, the early 90s that they kind of started nailing down that practical bike, um, you know, that core. Right? And that's in the mid 90s is when I started working at a bike shop in Madison, a budget bicycle center, um, which kind of has its own little reputation out there, which is kind of fun. I've learned that. Um, and I just remember selling hybrids to families day in and day out when I first started. Um, that, those first couple summers, I sold new bikes. Um, and then when I wasn't selling new bikes, I was tuning up used bikes. And it was, you know, these hybrids were so practical and, and so durable and easy to ride and that sort of thing. 
Um, but mountain biking was really also a thing. Everybody was buying mountain bikes to ride around college campuses. They were also very practical bikes. I just think they're super uncomfortable and dumb. Mid nineties mountain bikes are some of my favorite, but upright handlebars, comfy seat, flat <laughs> pedals, slick tires. You've got yourself a really good, you know, hybrid. ATV <laughs> yeah. or hybrid. Yeah. yeah. I, I hate 26 by one and a half inch tires. There's my <laughs> least favorite tire size, but two inch, 26 by two slicks. I mean, that's the best. That's, oh man. And all of those old mountain bikes are perfect for that. Um, so it's there. And like my customers here at Gibbs, now it's a really small little, you know, town. It's a rural town of 6,000 people. They eat it up with a fork and spoon and they come in and they're like, well, we just want to try it. We'd like to buy something used and I can, and they're like, Whoa, this is really comfortable. And this rolls really good. And I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. you can buy this for 350 bucks or a brand new giant Cypress for 600 bucks. And then neither one's a good option. Trek always. So they had these like kind of this ethos of practical bikes. And then they always had the high end up here. Right. But I, from where I sit, it seems like in the late nineties when Greg LeMond kind of came on the scene, and then Lance, it really like the Trek US Postal Service, Discovery Channel, that whole thing became this really big bohemoth and road cycling took over, right? And that happened everywhere in America. I mean, it was crazy. And all of a sudden there was this new market that they sold into and they really went all in on that. Um, the carbon fiber manufacturing, I think, was a big part of it, you know, um, and and the rest of it just kind of fell by the wayside, it seems like. It just, I don't know, um, mountain biking developed so much. Um, I mean, that kind of happened after, but like I would say like 2010 and forward, right? That's when the mountain bikes got way more complex and um, the trails got so much better and the bikes got way better. I mean, the technology, it's like unbelievable what has happened in mountain biking and yeah it just seems like the whole industry has jumped the shark when we lived in uh, missoula there it's um, the home base of adventure cycling and they've got an awesome library they have all of the issues of bicycling magazine from like its inception to modern day and there was like a marked shift like when what used to be cover what used to be on the cover was like practical bikes or you know commuting or you know lots of touring stories and all of a sudden there was this dividing line uh, around when Le Mans uh, won that became all racing from from that point mm. forward <laughs> so like 86 or 89 uh, or right in there so, some somewhere in there yeah yeah, yeah so like, like when i watched that video i and you were talking about trek specifically you know i, I interpreted it as like that's the story of like just just cycling in America, or I, I mean, it could be worldwide, you know, like that, uh, what was once, uh, you know, maybe a practical tool or wasn't so race focused, you know, racing is, you know, overshadowed every other, you know, form of cycling. It is. I mean, it, it's, it's the whole culture, right. And that's been, you know, I, I address it in my cyclists video as I had to rename that one because I like, um, the, it was, it was, demonetized from day one. So because of the thumbnail, I was like double middle fingers pointing at, at my head. I think they thought it looked like guns or something. I could never get a real, which sucks. Finger, it finger had like, pistols. <laughs> yeah. I had like finger pistols going and like, oh, it sucks that it was demonetized because it was really cranking, but I felt like I needed to do something about it. And I didn't know what to do about it. And I, so I like reposted it or re-uploaded. It was a big no-no in the algorithm. Everybody hates it, even the algorithm. I, I really messed that up. So nobody's seen that. I mean, it's not true. I think combined now, it's like 80 or 80,000 or something like that. So a lot of people have mm -hmm. seen it. But um, in there, I talk about cyclists, right, and the cycling culture. Um, and that's what I'm talking about in there is that, like, come on. You know, people just want to buy a bike. They don't want to buy an identity. Um, and yeah that whole racing thing and like there's this culture and it's like it becomes exclusive and that's why i hear it every single day somebody's like i'm not a big biker i don't race or anything like that i don't need a trek or anything fancy right and i'm like man you know just because it says trek on the side of it doesn't mean that it's <laughs> fancy right it just means that it's it's good quality it's it means that it's a good bike and that's what we want you to have is a good bike it doesn't mean that it's you have to race it it doesn't mean that you have to wear tights like yeah you know um 
but yeah, it did happen around then, you know, which, um, you know, I think Grant Peterson saw it coming, right. Or felt it where he was yeah. at at Bridgestone and, um, and I don't, you know, I just, you know, so there, but that is when everything split, right. Um, yeah. Speaking of which, you know, I don't think we can have this conversation without talking about Lord Grant. Um, <laughs> but if I were to sell everything and move to Spain, I would bring my 1996 Rivendell all rounder that was made in Waterford with 753 tubing. It's the greatest bike ever built. I love it. And I really, I wish that, I mean, Rivendell's amazing and it's like, totally my ethos even the like super fanciness of how these bikes are built and you know all of that but you know i want to do that but for six hundred dollars you know right. like how yeah. do we you know alivio derailleurs for you know on a steel bike for 600 bucks and it just doesn't seem like it's it's that tough especially yeah. if you're as big as trek I think maybe right. Trek could make it happen, like a like the scale that Rivendell works at, probably not. Just that the right. volumes aren't there, but yeah, yeah, totally. And um, and I, so I, I like that you know Rivendell's doing that where they're like, no, 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 the bikes have to be beautiful too. You know, right. I mean, I, I really I appreciate that. You know, I've got uh, a Gibson guitar and mm -hmm. Grotto headphones and Red Wing boots, and you know, I like buy it for life, really well crafted products in my life. I that's my personal deal but that's not for everybody a lot of people just want you know a, a decent bike and i said steel frame before but i really think that the ideal bike would be made with an aluminum frame you know do you think the bike industry is is on like a sustainable path i feel like in some ways that it's kind of doomed to failure um i'll give you i'll give you one one reason why yeah. um so, so imagine you live in a town of like 100 people and you make you know, a widget that five people really like. And all you do is keep making that same widget for those same five people. And you never try to, you know, reach out to the other 95 people in town. And when those people die or that they lose interest, you know, it seems as if like the, the market that they're addressing is so narrow and there hasn't been much work to kind of expand it. I think, I think about the bicycle clinic where in some of my videos, you'll see the sign and that's the shop that was in here in Lake Mills. When I started, those are the guys that let me hang around and, and whatever. And they were a Trek dealer in the late eighties, early nineties. Um, and they would literally order bikes and drive over with their pickup truck and put them in the back of the pickup truck and then come sell them. Um, you know, it was very backyard. Um, and they, they really struggled. I mean, they, um, they never made money doing it. It was always a hobby back then to have this little bike shop in Lake Mills. They had full-time jobs and, um, they're just like me, it's like, how, you know, three days a week or five days a week, or how do you, you know, this small population and even the Trek bikes from those days, um, were really hard to sell in small markets, um, in rural towns where there's not a ton of money or, you know, that, that sort of thing. Right. And people were still coming to them with department store bikes, wanting them fixed and comparing the products that they see at the bike store with the products I see at the department store, you know, they're the same thing. They're both rideable two wheeled objects, right? Um, they struggle with the exact same problems back then as I do now. Mm -hmm. So I have to assume and, um, you know, that the somebody with a marketing budget, the size of Trek Cor Cor bicycle corporation is going to be able to do market research and they're going to get real numbers, real statistics. And they, they've got to know more about this than, I do because I don't know anything about that sort of thing. So what feels like it makes sense to me, maybe might not actually make profitable sense to a, a, a business, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe you have to, um, I mean, every bike brand forever always had racing bikes, you know, Schwinn always had Paramount, right? I don't know if we'll ever get to like that early seventies bike boom era where everybody's buying Schwinn collegiates and varsities. <laughs> you know, like the mm -hmm. most practical bikes. I mean, like, man, those things, you want to talk about durability? Those are like <laughs> the greatest American made products ever produced. I mean, they're so yeah. cool. I mean, a, a can of WD 40, any, any <laughs> one of those bikes, you give me a can of WD 40 and it's tuned up in four minutes. <laughs> That's crazy. Those things, but, um, they're pretty uncomfortable. 
you know, like I've always held that as like a hypothesis. It's like, why not, you know, target the other like 95% that you're not speaking to. And it might yeah. be th that the amount of resources to acquire those customers, um, isn't worth it. It makes more sense to just sell, you know, more expensive parts to the, the same enthusiast market. Like that's an yeah. easier thing to do. You know, the problem is, is that the, the Alivio derailleurs and aluminum frames and this and that, they're so durable, right? So you do, you run out of customers eventually. Um, so as a manufacturer, I just don't even know. You got to innovate, you know, to keep it going. Then again, um, people, I mean, I think people need more than one bike. And if you make them cheap enough, they can have more than one bike. You know, they can have a road bike and a hybrid and a mountain bike. You know, they're, I'm aging myself, right? There's only three kinds of bikes, people. <laughs> um, you know, I want to go back to, you, you said you think, you feel like the industry is doomed. And you opened with that. And I was like, no, it's not. I think I'm afraid <laughs> to admit it. You know, yeah. <laughs> um, it doesn't. I don't know how you solve the problem. I just don't know. I feel like what you're talking about and what I was talking about in that video, I feel like it's wishful thinking and that I, that I, or we don't know what we're talking about from a marketing standpoint mm -hmm. and how ever from a manufacturing standpoint, of how you, you know, maintain this, it, you know, I think I'm afraid to, to admit it. Uh, but so I, I, I feel like I, I, if I was Trek, I would, I would stop using the Electra brand and start calling those bikes Treks again. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, I think what down or what right sizing means. I, you know, um, I like to, I personally, what I've been thinking about is like, okay, if I'm going to cut my catalog 40%, what's left? I think you, you alluded to this idea in, in one of your videos that, I mean, bikes are so good and they're so durable. And to some extent for the whole industry to keep going, um, you know, people have to make, make up problems, <laughs> Yeah, you know, or like when, when components get released, you know, it's not because there's any like real innovation it's kind of just a publishing schedule so we can get people back in the stores so they can you know buy some things and you know restart the process all over again but it's not from like you know, there's something innately wrong with you know the, the bicycle per se it's just these changes have to be made to, to keep this to keep the juggernaut going i mean i land on surly a lot when i think through these problems as you know they're making really durable really practical bikes but they also are in the categories um you know, that we're talking about that kind of, you know, the bike industry has become, you know, they're definitely kind of alt cycling darlings, right? You know, we got to right. like them, um, but they're too expensive still. Um, I can't sell them at my shop. I've tried. Um, I want to. The preamble, I think, is a really nice start to creating an affordable one. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. a thousand bucks, it's great. I feel but, like I know the answer to this, but do you, do you think there are too many categories of bikes? <laughs> absolutely. Um, you know, and I get it too, because I mean, sort of, I get it. No, I don't get it. <laughs> I don't get it. Um, there are too many categories of bikes. There's an infinite number of things you could do with a really just great bike frame, like the bridge club. Um, it's a real sweet spot geometry, I think. And I can't, I always feel like I can never speak intelligently about frame design and frame geometry. But for me, it's something that you can, that you put drop bars on or flat bars or alt bars, um, a different saddle, different wheel and tire combination, and just have umpteen different options for that bike. Um, when I first got back into things in 2015 to 2017 or so, Oh, what was it? There was a bike shop in Southern California, Ocean Side Bicycles, and they had the Rambler mm -hmm. or something like that. Am I getting that right? But they had just had this frame that seemed like it could do it all, and they would just build a different bike with it every time. You know, kind of like mm -hmm. a Blue Luck Dogs. You know, they have these bike builds, and they, they come up with stuff. That's always fascinated me. So I, you know, just have one frame and, you know, make it modular kind of thing. There's right. been other brands that have tried this, right? Yeah. Yeah. To me, it really, you got road bikes, you've got off road bikes, and you've got the in betweener bikes. And <laughs> if you're going to 
race or compete or, um, you know, you find something like randoneering. Um, you want to talk about the least practical form of biking. <laughs> it's my favorite. Randoneering is a fascinating cultural study. Like, man, got to get some uh, an anthropo cultural anthropologist to just dive into it someday. So fascinating. What a fascinating world. But, like, it's just road biking. I mean, that's all it is, is road biking. Yeah. Um, but, like, man, you know, when you're on the bike for 20 hours in a day, um, you know, for multiple days, I've never done any of the really long stuff, but um, everything's got to be just right. And you got to be prepared for anything. So there's a lot of thought that goes into those machines. And um, it's, it's just a really fascinating subset. And I get it, you know, but essentially they're road bikes. Essentially they're drop bar hybrids is what they are, you know. Um, that's what they truly are is drop bar hybrids and mm -hmm. or touring bikes, I suppose, um, which is just hybrids are just flat bar touring bikes. <laughs> so, you know, that can all be one bike and you, it's just how you set it up for yourself. That's how, yeah. you know, but again, then again, I'm a, I'm a mechanic first, right? So it's really easy for me to imagine the little things you can do to change that bike and make it whatever you want. Uh, let's bring it back to YouTube for a second. So you've started the channel, you've got the bike shop. Uh, what's the future of the channel and, and how, I mean, I'm assuming it's helping the bike shop in, in some way. Like what, how do you see them? How, how do you see the synergies in the future? Um, so one thing I have, the one, one major synergy I have is an endless supply of used bikes to tune up and make videos from. I take bikes on trade in. Um, if that slows down, I have sources where I can go buy others and, um, you know, I can always do that. Or like this winter, I had a handful of customer bikes coming in and I had more time in the winter so I could like film tune ups of tuning up other people's bikes. So, um, it just makes sense that, you know, I'm kind of a watch me work kind of channel um mm -hmm. and endless supply of that now obviously what i really would like to do is more ride videos like you know kind of how you got started with your touring um adventure biking is so much fun and so i have i guess ultimately i'd like to get the channel to the point where it supplies enough income somehow to not have to do the bike mobile anymore and then i can mm -hmm. take that van and build it out into an adventure van and start doing more ride videos. I just had a comment this morning. Somebody's like, Hey, love your bike videos. I watch them, but it's getting a little repetitive. Can you do more ride videos? And I'm like, that'd be great if I didn't have to make a living fixing bikes. <laughs> um, just to kind of downsize my life, I'd like to, you know, maybe not have to do the bike mobile anymore. So the YouTube channel, I'm trying to create a passive income that's not passive at all. Uh, it's a lot of work. Um, you know, that kind of takes the edge off. So I don't have to do certain things to eat. Um, and then yeah. really focus on the content that I want to make. Um, you know, I got, um, some good, um, some good microphones for riding bikes and, you know, wind, I watched a couple of your videos on that gear and that really helped. So thank you for those videos. And, um, I got a drone, you know, um, for Christmas. Oh yeah. It's right here. <laughs> what, I got one of these hover drones. Oh, no. Um, uh, what's his name? Old shovel did a video and I was like, Oh, that's pretty slick. And so I've been playing with that, but you know, it's winter here and all of the nice days that are warm enough to go out and play are super windy. So it doesn't work, with, mm, you know? Great. So yeah. uh, I think actually, yeah, yeah, it's still pretty windy today. It's, we get some good days here and there, but I want to get out and play with that. Um, you know, and get out there. And I, I hear that from people is like, Oh yeah, you know, take us around. And, um, ideally, I'm out playing on bikes, filming it. And then, you know, I mean, that's the dream, right? A while back. So I started a nonprofit in Madison and it was actually an affiliate nonprofit with free bikes for kids. It started in Minneapolis and I started the Madison chapter and, um, really cool program where you would do a citywide bike drive and collect like thousands of bikes and then spend 10 weeks with volunteers cleaning them up and then give them all away to kids at the end. It's a lot of department store bikes, but whatever. Um, and this is years ago. There was, as different chapters were popping up around the country, we all got together in Minneapolis for a sum summit and we were supposed to read this book. I can't remember the name of it, but it, it helped you narrow down what your core values are in your life. And for me, it came down to authenticity and creativity. And I just found that out about myself that I, I really 
think authenticity and just being myself is really important, but I need to be creative. And so mm -hmm. when I moved into this place, uh, which I call the bike farm and started creating my bike business and all of that was on my mind, discovering this YouTube thing, um, the creative aspect of it, the scripting of the videos and recording them and then the editing is so much fun and being funny and edgy and you know all of that is really it's fun work for me i, I enjoy it um and it's not fixing bikes right <laughs> which i've always said and i still kind of think it's true but i like fixing them more than riding them so i don't <laughs> mind fixing them i love building bikes but i'd rather be building my own creations creatively than tuning up other people's bikes for a living right yeah although that doesn't bother me a whole lot but um so that's part of the whole bike farm universe and the bike farming and the different sources of income. YouTube is just one of those things now, but I really want it to kind of be the main thing. So I actually yeah. um, was glad when you reached out because I was going to, you know, see if you could make some time to talk through some of the other ways to monetize it. And, mm -hmm. you know, how, how do you actually make this like core part of your life? Because I, I think I see myself heading there. Yeah. Like I keep tabs on, uh, lots of channels that, that seem interesting. I think, I think you can pull it off. I have faith. <laughs> oh, that's really good to hear. I mean, that's, uh, um, yeah, I mean, that's the kind of thing you need to hear from, you know, in order to keep going because it is so yeah. much work and there's so much uncertainty. Um, yeah. my wife's an author, um, and you know, she's published one novel. Uh, she's got another one in the works and I mean, it's way harder in that universe to, you know, <laughs> be successful at it, whatever that successful means. I mean, I think if you write one book, you're already successful, but yeah, um, YouTube is so cool because you can be rough around the edges and people are into it and they do appreciate the authenticity and um, mm -hmm. it really hits my core values. So I really appreciate that. And I also want, I've always thought that I had a potential to have a channel where it's like, no, you can quit your job and never have to work for someone again <laughs> and do what you love. You know, like you can do yeah. that, like the whole solopreneur thing. When, when yeah. I started working for, when I started working for profit and not for wages is really when I started to feel my, my life become freer and um, yeah, it's scary and uncertain and I barely have two nickels to rub together, but I, you know, have a nice guitar and nice bike. And <laughs> I love doing what I do. So, well, thanks for being on the podcast. And, uh, if you guys haven't already, be sure to subscribe to Andy, uh, the bike farmer on YouTube. And, uh, as always, everybody keep the supple side down. <laughs>